Hello Jane friends, this is Devaney Lozer, and I'm happy to have a chance to talk to you in these strange and difficult times about the early history of Jane Austen's 1816 novel Emma and its afterlife on the stage. I've got a talk filled with images and stories, most of which I can almost guarantee even the most died in the world Jane Knight has never heard before. And it's an honor to have this chance to be a part of Virtual Jane Con and to think about the long history of reading Austen and watching Emma adaptations in difficult times. Now, in this talk, I'm going to share new research I've had the pleasure to complete, following up on work I published in my book, The Making of Jane Austen. In that book, I investigated some understudied and previously unknown pop culture patterns in Austen's afterlife, including some of the unknown parts of the history of book illustration, dramatization, political speech, educational materials, and some early film. Uh, these have been roads less taken in Austen scholarship over the past uh, two centuries. If you'd like to read my book, it's been made available for free download until May 31st, 2020 through Project Muse by Johns Hopkins University Press, and you can find a link to that on my website, devony.com. What I want to focus on with you today is Emma's dramatization, the story of putting her characters, scenes, and plot, especially uh, from the 1860 novel Emma, on the stage. And I'll share not only some fun and little-known facts about that history that I'm discovering in my new research, but what I think are some pretty interesting stories, too, about what it meant to consider that text in past troubled times. Now, you might be asking, why Austen and the stage? Could dramatizing her novels really have been that important to building her reputation and legacy? And the answer is yes. My shorthand for convincing people who might be skeptical of that angle is to show them the movie poster for the first Hollywood Austin film adaptation, that's MGM's 1940 Pride and Prejudice, which starred or Lawrence Olivier and Greer Garson. Now you can see there the taglines across the top of the poster. One of the most famous novels, one of the most famous plays, one of the most famous pictures ever filmed. Now of course you should be saying to yourself, well, this is advertising. But you might also be saying to yourself, wait, they were selling Pride and Prejudice to audiences as one of the most famous plays? Absolutely. And it's not just Pride and Prejudice. Austin's Emma on the stage has a vigorous, complicated, and storied history, going back at least to the mid-19th century and lasting well into the film and television era in its significance. So dramatizing Austen has been a significant force in moving her and her fiction forward in interesting gender-bending and political progressive directions, and then in another transformational moment in ways that are predictable and surprising, including horror films, wartime women, stage bombs, and actual bombings. And I'm going to tell you more about all of those in this talk. Uh, it, deeper history of the reception of the novel is important to grasp, that is, how it was crafted by Austen's many pioneering adapters and how it was received by audiences, its reception in previous generations. Now, I know a lot of you uh, watching this lecture are probably devotees of Austen film adaptations. You might have had the chance to see Autumn de Wilde's fabulous new Emma film in the theaters or streaming. And if you haven't, I hope that you will get a chance. DeWilde has said that though she had no idea her film might turn out to serve as a kind of escape in difficult times, she had no idea, obviously none of us did, exactly what 2020 would hold in that way. She did make her film, she said, to offer a kind of escape, as well as social commentary and criticism. And it turns out that desire for an Emma escape also has a very long popular history. So this talk is organized into five parts or stories, and I'd like for us to start with The Voluble Lady. It's a fun, gender-bending, maybe even queer fact. One of the first ways that Austen's Emma came onto the stage was through performances by female impersonators. I wrote about this history very briefly in an essay I published in The Atlantic, but I'd like to extend it and illustrate it for you now. Readers in the 1840s could be forgiven for thinking that Jane Austen wrote a short story called The Voluble Lady. 
That's because a piece by that title was published in 1847 in a monumental series of 300 literary excerpts in Half Hours with the Best Authors. Now, this series first appeared in serialized form, that is, in weekly parts, and were later sold as a multi-volume work. The project was the brain child of Charles Knight, a visionary publisher and educator who set out, after the outrage of the 1819 Peterloo Massacre, to provide cheap, quality literature for the newly literate working class. And that's how his biographer put it. Knight sold inexpensive excerpts. Some critics have suggested Knight was providing a means of social control for the working classes, but what Knight saw himself as doing was providing choices and greater access. Of course, he was making money as well, so how you judge his efforts um, is up to you. Literacy levels at this period of history are hard to measure. Knight's own rough estimate was that three-quarters of the English population in this period could read and about half could write. Now, that's a number in line with the best guesses by historians. But Knight felt that reading materials for the newly literate had problems. He thought they were too expensive, geared toward children or of low literary quality. And he wanted to make valuable works more affordable and readable. One of the works he turned to was Jane Austen's Emma. Half Hours with the Best Authors was constantly reinvented and republished in the United States and Great Britain. By 1906, it was being touted as the most famous of all libraries of literature. Not every edition included Austen's The Voluble Lady. Contents were made up primarily of dead authors, including just a handful of women. Each excerpt began with a paragraph about its author. Now, Austen's paragraph from 1847 highlights her genius and her staying power. It was probably written by editor Knight. Uh, he wrote, of the hundreds of novels that have been published since the beginning of the present century, who can remember even the names of a 20th part? The larger number are quietly sleeping on the shelves of the circulating libraries of the country towns. But, Knight writes further, there are six novels that can never be old, the works of the inimitable Jane Austen. He concludes, no dust will ever settle on them, even, on, even in the libraries of the least tasteful of communities. Old and young, learned and unlearned, equally delight in the productions of the marvelous young woman. And he goes on to conclude, this is indeed genius. Now Knight follows this paragraph with an excerpt from Emma. A plot spoiler alert coming up here. I'm going to assume that most of you know the plot of Emma. Its handsome, clever, and rich heroine, Emma Woodhouse, makes a grave social mistake from the pinnacle she inhabits in the society of her small millage. She insults a cheerful, garrulous, good-hearted, middle-aged spinster, Miss Bates, who lives in genteel poverty. And, of course, she's corrected for that mistake by Mr. Knightley, an older neighbor who is the hero of the tale. Now, it's Miss Bates who is the voluble lady of Knight's title. In the original novel, the phrase never appears. Miss Bates is once described as having a cheerful volubility, but that's as close as it gets. The voluble lady is Knight's own creation, and it's almost entirely in Miss Bates' voice. Some readers of Emma admit to skipping over Miss Bates' speeches. This is how they look on the page of the original novel, long text blocks with no breaks. So you could skip over reading them without missing much plot-wise. But for a 19th century reader, Miss Bates' speeches were appreciated as a moment of comic relief and a setup of a commonly ridiculed type. So her speeches were presented as a welcome, broadly comic interlude. Now here are just a few lines of Miss Bates' dialogue from the section of Emma that Knight selected for his voluble lady. So very obliging of you. No rain at all. Nothing to signify. I do not care for myself. Quick, quite thick shoes. And Jane declares, well, as soon as she was within the door. Well, this is brilliant indeed. This is admirable. Excellently contrived upon my word. Nothing wanting. Could not have imagined it. Nothing happens in the course of this long speech. What it offers is a clear sense of how Miss Bates' mind works, back and forth in time, hopping from a memory to some random connection to an observation of something in front of her own eyes. This excerpt is also remarkable because it would have been read and heard by hundreds of thousands, and perhaps more, 
of people in the United Kingdom, the United States, and globally. It may have been some Victorian readers and viewers' first exposure to Austen. Not only was the excerpt included in constantly reprinted versions of Knight's Half Hours with the Best Authors, other editors lifted this section wholesale, recycling the made-up title, The Voluble Lady. It would have been read both silently and aloud by people of all classes, especially in homes where leisure time was measured by the half hour. It appeared in Readings in English Prose, selected from the best writers in 1857, as you can see here. It also appeared, it also appeared in Major's, Codes, Major's New Code Readers and the School Board Readers in the 1870s. It even appeared in a logic textbook as an example of a conversation without reasoning. But by the end of the 19th century, there were dozens, if not hundreds, of magazines and books that had reprinted, abridged, or excerpted Knight's The Voluble Lady. It was a pioneering Austin excerpt. It's also notable for one further reason. The Voluble Lady began to appear in performance as a spoken word piece voiced by both amateur and professional actors. The part of the voluble lady, Miss Bates, was most often played by a male actor in what was called a dame part for self-described female impersonators. The part of the voluble lady was first popularized by amateur actors. In 1861, a Mr. H. Joyner performed it as a school gathering for penny readings. His reading was deemed a capital wind-up and met with an echo of applause. In 1864, Mr. Parmiter's voluble lady met with warm applause in Winchester and a Mr. Hunter in Leicester provoked roars of laughter. In 1865, the voluble lady was performed to a room fairly filled by one man named Mr. Girdlestone, apparently a real name. The voluble lady was even played by a clergyman, the Reverend R. Hay Hill, whose fidgety old lady provoked frequent roars of laughter to a large audience in attendance. The piece made its way into the repertoires of professional actors, Noted Shakespearean actor Henry Forrester performed the part in London in 1870 as the last bit in a variety show where much amusement was caused. Actor M.A. Lloyd performed the role with humor at Dublin's Coffee Palace, a popular temperance hall in 1889, for a large and appreciative audience. The list of such performances could go on and on. I found evidence of the voluble lady being performed as late as 1902, this time with a rare female actor playing the part, American elocutionist and teacher Mrs. Emily Farrow Gregory. But most often in the 19th century, the character of Miss Bates would have been played loudly by men pretending to be women. Now this turns out to be an important feature of Austin in performance, not a bug. Today's Austin is a teller of stories, whose work may be made to gender bend. In Before the Fall, Darcy and Elizabeth are played by two men. Charlotte Green's novel, Pride and Porters, features two women. Joel Kim Booster is developing a Pride and Prejudice set on Fire Island. Now these adaptations didn't appear out of thin air. They are part of a long history. The voluble lady might not be classed as queer Austin in a gender progressive sense, but it is yet another previously unrecognized part of Austen's wild ride of an afterlife, demonstrating how her name, her words, and her reputation have long moved us to ask new questions about how we watch and value gender identities and loving relationships of all kinds. All right, part two, some intemperate girls. Even after putting the voluble lady back in our Austin reception histories, however, we must acknowledge that Austin was later to the stage than her fellow novelists. Some 19th century authors' works were transformed to the stage almost immediately, and these include things like Scott's Waverly novels, Dickens fiction, Bronte's Jane Eyre, and so on, but Austin's fiction wasn't. Once Austin-inspired plays did start appearing, scholars didn't pay much attention to them. Perhaps that's because, as one critic put it, no one writes Jane Austen as well as Jane Austen. Any tinkering means a change for the worse. It's hard to imagine a Jane Knight arguing with that. But there was a time when Austen's works weren't even thought of as dramatizable. 
and an anonymous American critic opined in 1894 that Austen should be thought of as drama proof. He exclaims, Miss Jane Austen seems to say noli me tangera to artistic embroiderers of every sort. Most of all, does she cry hands off to the intending dramatist. Yet this critic identifies an Austen-inspired dramatist himself. He writes, a well-known man of letters told me the other day that some intemperate girl had sent up a stage version of Emma. Even the newest woman could not make such an experiment a success. Intemperate girl. Uh, he's referring to what was then called the New Woman Movement, an early mainstream feminism that stressed women's independence of all kinds. Unfortunately, the name of this intemperate girl dramatist of Emma seems to have been lost to history. But within months of this critic statement, a pioneer playwright made the experiment a major success. Rosina Filippi, a respected actress and director who also ran an acting school and taught elocution, published her duologues and scenes from the novels of Jane Austen, arranged and adapted for drawing room performance, which was a 140 page book in 1895. Having tested her scenes out with an amateur theater troupe she directed in Oxford, she brought them to print. Felipe's scenes were geared toward female actors, with 12 of 16 parts designed for females. The focus was on Austen's humor, showcasing women exerting personal power in social settings. Felipe, an elocution teacher who ran an acting school, presented Austen's stories to give young women opportunities to develop and display verbal self-confidence. Now, women dramatists seem especially to have been drawn to the task. Of the 50 Austen dramatizations published between 1895 and 1975, 62% were written by women, 30% by men, and 4% by collaborator couples. Some of them we can't identify yet by gender. Felipe's duologues paved the way for all of them. Several of her scenes were excerpted in textbooks, and she inspired many copycats. Reviewers praised Felipe for how little she tinkered with Austen's prose in her seven scenes adapted from four novels. Felipe's choosing to dramatize three of those scenes from Emma suggests that novel's primacy as an Austen text for the stage. Felipe makes Emma the sympathetic character, positioned to send up the fools who surround her. In Felipe's scenes, Emma Woodhouse is a naive, clever girl who deserves more than a delicate, a little more than a delicate chastisement for her romantic meddling. The handsome, rich, and thinking a little too well of herself parts are de-emphasized in Felipe's scenes. After Felipe's pioneering effort, dozens of dramatized Austen scenes and plays for amateurs emerged, with Pride and Prejudice overshadowing Austen's other novels in terms of the frequency of its dramatization. Yet Emma continued to play a role. Rose Patry's dramatic scenes from great novelists included a scene from Emma titled Miss Smith Consults Miss Woodhouse About Mr. Martin's Proposal of Marriage. Patry makes it explicit that her scenes are meant for schools, women's institutes, etc., to be played without scenery. Her Austen scene emphasizes Emma's meddling and snobbishness while revealing Harriet's malleable stupidity. One hardly knows which to find more blameworthy, which seems to be Patry's point. But the early 20th century's most significant private theatrical of Emma was one stage in Massachusetts. It was a scene or a series of scenes by the young playwright Eleanor Holmes Hinckley, who was the beloved first cousin of poet T.S. Eliot. You can read a little more about Hinckley in my book, The Making of Jane Austen, because her play, Dear Jane, which was mounted in New York in 1932, uh, was a, a pioneering bio play of Austen's life. Some years earlier, however, in February 1913, Hinckley hosted a theatrical salon that staged a stand-alone Emma scene. It was titled An Afternoon with Mr. Woodhouse. Modernist poet T.S. Eliot played the valetudinarian Mr. Woodhouse. The actor who played Mrs. Elton was Eleanor Holmes Hinckley's talented classmate, Emily Hale. Eliot was apparently already in love with her. So it was a Mr. Woodhouse playing opposite a Mrs. Elton with whom he was in love. Hinckley's Emma scene was apparently never published. 
More details of this day are emerging now, however, from Elliot's letters to Hale, which were just unsealed at Princeton University's library on January 1st, 2020. It seems to have taken 40 years after Felipe's duologues for the first full-length Emma to be adapted for the professional stage. So let's head there next. When it happened, it was from the pen of a man best known today for his feline-inspired horror film, which brings us to part three, How Emma Met Cat People. On December 16, 1936, so Austin's birthday, the playwright DeWitt Bodine registered for copyright his play Emma, a comedy in three acts. He later retitled it Romances by Emma. There's little doubt that he wrote this work because the previous year, in 1935, Helen Jerome's Pride and Prejudice play had become a Broadway hit. Bodine's Emma made its main stage debut at the Pasadena Playhouse, a renowned community theater in California, on February 23, 1937. Five years later, DeWitt Bodine co-authored the 1940 Bodine also wrote the screenplay for The Curse of the Cat People, a quasi-sequel that focuses on a daydreaming girl. Now, the latter theme may have slightly more in common with Austin's Emma, but Bodine's horror films are not obvious resume accompaniments for an Austin dramatist. Still, it's a bizarre and fun fact of literary history the apparent first professional Emma dramatist also wrote cult classic horror films. It may st start to make that whole pride and prejudice and zombies thing seem a little less outlandish or new. In his introduction to Romances by Emma, Bodine makes it clear that he has a conservative take on Jane Austen. He claims that Austen was not concerned with changing social orders, but with the ever-present comedy of society. Of course, we might respond that a lack of concern with changing the social order is very much still a concern with the social order. Compare Bodine's play to one published a decade earlier titled Elizabeth Refuses by Margaret McNamara, the feminist, socialist, pacifist playwright. Bodine's Emma is not at all in McNamara's mode. His Emma does not refuse, rebel, or behave okinoclastically. His play normalizes her snobbery and downplays her agency. It basically weakens or omits Emma's hateful statements about economic and social privilege. Bodine softens the character of Emma, but in the process, he takes away much of her power. Bodine's Emma takes place entirely in the drawing room at Hartfield. It requires just one set. And it's decorated, he stipulates, with cartoonish wreaths for a Christmas scene and then red hearts and cupids for a Valentine's Day scene. Bodine gives Robert Martin a large speaking part, wandering around the stage after Harriet Smith, as the directions suggest, in a trance, intoning, Yes, Miss Smith. Indeed, Martin seems to answer every woman he meets with a dreamy, Yes, Miss Smith, once even addressing Emma in this way. Making Martin just as naive as Harriet reorients the audience's sense of what Harriet deserves in marriage. Bodine makes the greatest changes in the character of Emma herself. There's no Box Hill scene and no insult to Miss Bates. Instead, Bodine has Mr. Knightley's criticisms of Emma center on her inappropriate matchmaking with Harriet. He quips that she may as well be wearing a placard around her neck advertising romances by Emma, as if she is authoring fictional stories. The play makes Mr. Knightley seem as if he's physically attracted to Harriet for a time. Bodine's Harriet reveals that Mr. Knightley kissed her goodnight with a very gentle kiss, not lingering, but sweet. This causes Emma to sink down on the sofa, sobbing. Bodine's Emma cries more than once. The play also suggests that Emma, once enlightened, seeks a husband who will keep her in line. Emma says she'll accept Mr. Knightley's proposal of marriage on one condition. I'll marry you, Mr. Knightley, provided you promise on your solemn word as a loyal husband that if you ever see me in this odious role of matchmaker, to shake me by the shoulders and take me most severely to account. Will you promise? Mr. Knightley promises, and Emma curtsies. Then Mr. Knightley 
taking her hand and drawing her to him. Emma, his arms close around her, and he kisses her uplifted face as the curtain falls. Bodine's is an Emma adaptation in which the heroine most soundly chastises herself while asking her future spouse to serve as her chaperone husband. Um, and you'll see here, obviously, Knightley gets the last word. There's no sense of Mr. Knightley moving into Hartfield or sharing power with his new wife here, is there? Bodine's Emma doesn't seem to have made its way to other professional stages after Pasadena, but it was recommended to teachers and directors for production in high schools as a quaint, charming English village story. Although Bodine seems to have been the first to write Mount and publish a full-length Emma dramatization, he didn't remain the only for long. In Bournemouth, a never-printed Emma stage adaptation by Miss Anne D. Parsons was performed at the Seaside Palace Court Theatre just ten months after Bodine's play. It was never printed and apparently never restaged. There's surely far more to learn here. Part four, putting the culture in agriculture. The next Emma, Emma dramatization will surprise you. It was by American Marianne Morse Mackay, and she wrongly believed hers to be the first Emma play ever attempted. She had reason for thinking herself to be an a, a poised to be an innovator. She married into an American dramatic dynasty. Her husband was the playwright and poet Percy Mackay. Her father-in-law was Steele Mackay, the famed playwright, actor, and theater manager who is best known for inventing the folding theater seat. Marion Mackay's mother-in-law, Mary Medbury Mackay, had published a very successful Pride and Prejudice dramatization 30 years earlier in 1906. Marion Mackay would seem almost destined to write this Emma dramatization. The Mackays were shopping her Emma play around England in 1937, just as Bodine's was being performed in faraway Pasadena. The play was optioned by an unnamed London producer, but it was shelved when the actor chosen to play Emma left England. The play was next considered for production by the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre in Stratford-upon-Avon, but the war and the Mackay's return to America stopped the progress there, too. Then tragically, after a short illness, Marion Mackay died unexpectedly in 1939. Her Emma traumatization had been neither staged nor printed. Grieving widower Percy Mackay made the project of staging and publishing it into a posthumous tribute. So Marion Mackay's Emma play ended up having its world debut in, wait for it, Fargo, North Dakota. This may seem to us quite a come down after the possibility of London or Stratford. But the little country theater in North Dakota in which Mackay's Emma appeared was then actually a renowned stage. Its production of Mackay's Emma made national news. The director of Mackay's Emma was the theatrical visionary Alfred Arvold. Arvold, a university faculty member, ingeniously coupled his theater with the stage agricultural extension movement. Arvold described himself as a man on a mission to put the culture in agriculture. Thanks to his programs, a farmer might get sent in the mail in the same package directions for fertilizer, and a play by Ibsen. It's a model worthy of Emma's reading and writing farmer Robert Martin. It may seem odd, but somehow also fitting that Mackay's Emma dramatization, set in a fictional small town, made its world debut in a theater devoted to bringing drama to rural areas. Arvold believed that drama could help address small town social stagnancy, loneliness, and mental illness, as well as slowing population flight to cities. Arvold's theater was what the fictional Emma might have called a charitable scheme. Marion Mackay surely didn't write her Emma adaptation with Arvold's masses on the prairie in her mind. But the play arose out of a lifetime of her reading the novel aloud with her husband and his suggestion, apparently, that she dramatize it. Of all the playwrights in the 1930s and 40s who tried their hand at Austin, Mackay has the most bona fide Janeite credentials. Yet Mackay's Emma too does away with the Box Hill scene, giving us again an Emma who does less harm and is only gently chastised for her matchmaking. 
Mackay, too, brings Jane and Frank's attachment to the notice of the audience right away, so that we're never put in the situation of sharing Emma's blindness to their relationship. Mackay crafts humorous new lines, including having Harriet Smith guess answers to Mr. Elton's courtship charade. Harriet's three answers are a trident, a mermaid, and a shark. Mackay's Emma had a middle-brow performance and high-brow print connections. It was printed by Macmillan, feted at the Gramercy Club in New York, and published under the auspices of the Harvard chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. As a result, we might say that it enacts the class mixing and stratification of the original novel. Yet, like DeWitt Bodine's 1935 version, Mackay's play was very little interested in exploring the original's social criticism. All right, last section. Big Emma bombed. There's actually a long history of adaptations of Emma appealing to audiences in difficult times. Picture yourself in this historical scene. You're in London in World War II. You decide to risk taking in an evening at the theater. The show starts early at 6.15 p.m. in order to let out by 8.30 so that the whole audience can get home before the mandated blackouts begin amidst German doodlebug nighttime bombings. London is under siege, but the show goes on. It's February 1945, and you're in one of the 1,200 seats of the St. James Theater, just blocks away from Buckingham Palace and Piccadilly Circus. The play you've come to see features lavish sets, props, and costumes. The movie starlet in the lead role delivers Scarlett O'Hara-esque lines, such as, Oh, fiddle-dee-dee to Mr. Knightley. The play you're taking in was the most successful professional stage adaptation to date of Austin's Emma. Across England in 1944-45, to 45, tens of thousands would have seen it. Yet few today have heard of the play or recognize its importance to the afterlife of Austin and Emma. To understand it, we have to back up a little bit first. After Marianne Mackay's play in North Dakota, another Emma dramatization emerged. In 1943, John Lindsay and Ronald Russell's Emma, a play in three acts, adapted from Jane Austen's famous novel, was performed at the Little Theater in Bristol in 1943. It had about 450 seats for a two-week run. Russell and Lindsay's dramatic version hews much closer to the original novel. Its editions are flourishes, such as having Mr. Elton read aloud from the fake Gothic novel The Mysterious Monk or The Mountain Rose. It has Mr. Knightley suggest to Mrs. Weston that he believes Emma needs a husband with the advantage of her in years and experience because of her strong will. It's a line that repurposes something Mr. Knightley teasingly says to Emma in the original, but in the play it comes close to turning Mr. Knightley himself into a matchmaker. Russell and Lindsay keep dialogue from the Box Hill scene, but they move it indoors because of a storm. So the lines are delivered and punctuated by thunderclaps. Russell and Lindsay have their Mr. Knightley apologize to Miss Bates after Emma's insult with, I must apologize for Emma's thoughtlessness. Emma responds later to the old brute, Mr. Knightley, and his proposal of marriage by confessing, I have always been a spoiled child. You have always said so, and you have always been right. Now I am to be your spoiled child. Promise me you will always rebuke me when I am naughty. Perhaps the less said in analyzing this line, uh, the better. Russell not only co-authored the screenplay, he founded and ran the theater in which it made its debut. His troupe, the Rapier Players of the Little Theater Bristol, mounted its Emma production in the face of wartime challenges and dangers. Its rival playhouse was bombed during the Bristol, Bristol Blitz in 1940, making the Rapier Players the only live theater left in Bristol during the war. Russell's co-author, Lindsay, was also the theater's set and cons costume designer. Tragically, he died a year before Emma took the stage in as-yet-unidentified circumstances, perhaps war-related. Russell, who was serving in the police war reserve, continued to direct the rapier players on his leaves, while his wife took over the full-time administration of the theater. Russell's wife, Peggy Ann Wood, was not only an actor, but a director and a theater manager. 
She took the lead role of Emma Woodhouse in her husband's co-authored play, co play, and she did everything else, too. As one source put it, during the war, Peggy Ann practically ran the theater single-handed and kept going with one show a week, constantly weekly rep, 48 shows a year. The actor who played Miss Bates, Constance Chapman, remembered Wood's wartime efforts with gratitude. As Chapman put it, all through the war, the rapier players were a little beacon of light, lifting the spirits of the audience. Peggy Ann not only played dozens of leading roles, but she often directed the productions and had a hand in the management and the programming. A blue plaque honoring the contributions of Russell and Wood has recently been erected in Bristol in honor of their 900 productions over 30 years at the Little Theater with the Rapier Players. Much more could be said about these productions and their productions of Emma. Now, all three of these plays, Bodine's, Mackay's, and Russell and Lindsay's, did moderately well. They appeared in regional theaters, were welcomed by audiences, and approved of by reviewers. All were eventually printed and licensed for subsequent performance, with productions mounted in untold other theaters and schools in the years that followed. And yet, in 1944, each was completely overshadowed. That's when Big Emma arrived. Playwright Gordon Glennon's Emma, a Play was the first dramatization of the novel to find a big-time producer and a notable star. It had a year-long tour of the English provinces, followed by a stint on the wartime London West End, as we heard a little bit ago. Playwright Gordon Glennon's Emma dramatization shares features with the Russell Lindsay adaptation of Emma in Bristol, and may even have been inspired by it. Glennon's play, too, translates the Box Hill scene's dialogue to a drawing room, where Mr. Knightley is far more winning and charming. His chastised Emma assures Mr. Knightley that she's proven wrong, she's been proven wrong in everything, and is truly humble now. Glennon has Mr. Knightley reveal Harriet Smith to be the daughter of a prosperous London pork butcher. Mr. Knightley takes Emma in his arms when she agrees to be his wife. Now, Glennon does something unusual in not ending the play there. Mr. Knightley vows to wait for Emma to be free to marry, to wait for Mr. Woodhouse to die if he won't agree to Knightley's moving into Hartfield. But Mr. Woodhouse does agree, and the play ends with all the men drinking to the health of three future brides, Jane Fairfax, Harriet Smith, and Emma Woodhouse, one by one. Each woman has a glass raised to her, and she curtsies in response in a sort of premature curtain call. Miss Woodhouse bows last, and then the curtain falls. In Glennon's version of the story, the young men are the powerful social directors. It's another conservative gender take, reducing female characters' agency into the performance of puppet-like curtsies. It's also an interesting piece of commentary during wartime, when, as we saw, women like Peggy Ann Wood were serving as theater directors themselves. Glennon's Emma seemed poised for greatness. The play was licensed for production by screen star heartthrob turned wartime theater manager Robert Donnett in March 1944. Cast as the play's Emma Woodhouse was film star Anna Neagle in what might be described as her first straight stage role. Neagle had started her career as a wildly successful chorus girl and dancer. She'd become a screen star, discovered by the producer Herbert Wilcox. He became Neagle's manager. A decade later, after he divorced, he became her husband. One of Neagle's earliest collaborations with Wilcox was on the film Nell Gwynn in 1934, a body part as a king's mistress that brought Neagle great acclaim and notoriety after having previously been known as a good girl. Nell Gwynn had been a hit movie in England, but before it came to America, the censors required that it cut out shots of Neagle's ample bosom and insisted on the addition of a moralizing prologue and epilogue. Fun fact, some sources claim that Neagle's run-in with the American Production Code censor is what first led to the term cleavage being coined for the cleft between a woman's breasts. According to Wilcox, when he asked what the censor meant by describing Neagle's exposed chest as cleavage, he was told it designated a valley between two mountains. So now you know, an early actor who played Emma Woodhouse may have been responsible for the emergence of the word cleavage. 
Neagle was also famous for portraying the character of Queen Victoria on film. Neagle's Emma was sent on a tour of the provinces and earned rave reviews in Manchester in May 1944. A week later, the play was said to have broken all records in Manchester. One performance was said to have required 24 curtain calls. A critic opined, I suspect that to many people, Austin's classic will become known as the book of the play. Every sign indicated its likely success when it opened in London. Critics thought it would surely be filling the St. James Theatre for some time. But neither London audiences nor London reviewers were as enthusiastic as the provincial ones had been. The first audiences were described as uncommonly bronchial, coughing repeatedly during the performance. As one critic put it, the players performed at times under a barrage of coughs, including some of those artificial coughs, which when mixed with foot shuffling in the gallery, strike people on the stage like blows at the heart. Miss Neagle, the reviewer concludes, is just a little too charming. The play ran for a respectable 60 performances, but it wasn't a hit. In her autobiography, Neagle blames the war for Emma's mediocre showing. She describes the dangers that actors and audiences alike felt in these performances during the war's last months. Neagle writes, There was no doubt that the V2s, that is the bombers, were bad for business. One matinee, when the theater was packed with ladies, mainly elderly, there was a tremendous crash, and a V-2 rocket had actually landed not far from the theater. Everything rocked. Mr. Weston, one of the characters in the play, burst onto the stage, crying, A catastrophe! Someone has broken into the turkey house! Not a turkey left! There was a momentary pause, and then a roar of laughter swept through the theater. But it turned out not to be very humorous at all. We learned, Neagle writes, that we had, in fact, had a lucky escape. Despite this disappointment in London, Wilcox and Neagle were slow to give up on Emma. Neagle was a Janeite who enjoyed a late-night dip into her favorite author. She had a heavily annotated copy of Emma, and her husband had bought her the present of a first edition of the novel for a hundred pounds. Neagle had even renamed her cottage in Elstree, England, Hartfield House. Whether it was her love of Austen or her belief in the play, in spring 1945, Neagle acquired the rights of Emma from Robert Dunnett. As one newspaper reported, Neagle planned to take it on tour before appearing as Harriet Beecher Stowe in a successful American play about the authoress of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Both projects were non-starters. Emma's poor London showing also put the brakes on at least one outcome that Wilcox intended turning Emma into a Hollywood film for Neagle. Wilcox plans Neagle film, reported the Motion Picture Herald, shortly after the production had wowed the provinces in 1944. Quite obviously, the report noted, Emma cries out to be made as a film with Miss Neagle in the leading role. Wilcox was said to be preparing a script. He'd already made an agreement with Technicolor. Columbia Pictures was said to have sat down with Wilcox, both parties eager to reach a deal. One source even claims that the film was actually made, but not released, although I've yet to find further proof of that. Had the film made it to the screen, Wilcox and Neagle's Emma would have been the first Austin film adaptation to be produced in color, and another Hollywood Austin film would have emerged from a hit play. It never happened, even if Anna Neagle got a Clark's shoe ad in her Emma outfit. We can certainly speculate, or like Emma Woodhouse, turn ourselves into imaginists about how Janeite history would have been changed had the Wilcox Emma film ever debuted. Instead, as many other scholars have described, Austin's Emma went on to have a robust showing on radio, TV, and finally film in the late 20th century. Yet each Emma adaptation, from the voluble lady to Rosina Filippi, to Fargo, North Dakota, to Anna Neagle in her Clark's Shoes advertisement, grew out of and was often influenced by the last adaptation. I hope this talk convinces you that for a century, the stage paved the way for keeping Emma alive and before popular audiences, perhaps just as much and sometimes more than print. 
It's funny to imagine this now, but there was arguably a brief moment in the 1940s in which Emma had greater name recognition than Jane Austen herself. This is surely in no small part thanks to all of the dramatizations we've just heard about. A short piece in the 1946 issue of the London-based magazine Housewife offers some further evidence. It tells the story of a supposed authentic conversation in a small public library of a country town. A patron is said to have declared to a librarian, I want a book called Emma by Jane Eyre. Emma is by Jane Austen, madam, the librarian replied. The patron said, Jane Austen? Yes, of course, one of the Bronte sisters. Now, this piece of humor ought to have us thinking differently about the impact of stage Emma on popular audiences. Austen's story, for a time, was even bigger than its author. When we talk about Emma's afterlife, looking for moments when its appealing, adaptable plot and characters overshadowed Austen as the author, we mustn't start the story with Clueless. With superb new versions of Emma from innovators like filmmaker DeWilde and playwrights we love like Kate Hamill, there are reasons, much needed reasons, to be hopeful going forward. Whenever we might return to a new cultural moment, we have the promise of a next revival of stage and screen, expanding cultural understandings of what we readers of Emma already know. This is a text that has as much to teach us that still has as much to teach us about women's use and abuse of power and about inequities in gender and class, or what Emma herself calls transgressing the duty of woman by woman. Thank you so much for listening. I hope to hear your thoughts and questions in real time uh, on Zoom on March 29th at noon Pacific time. And that will be... Um, hosted through the information given on Drunk Austin, or anytime you want to be in touch via email, Twitter, Facebook, uh, or my author newsletter. I really look forward to staying virtually connected until such time as we're able to share physical spaces again, hopefully in good health and, uh, and very soon, in perfect happiness, I might say, uh, very soon. Great to talk to you. Look forward to more conversations.